as we come to Revelation chapter 7. Let's pray and ask for God's help to understand his word today. Heavenly Father, please thrill our hearts with your truth this morning and grant us the grace to believe it and to live in the light of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. All of us want to belong. We are relational beings and so we instinctively like to be part of a group, whether a family or the in crowd or a group of fans at a football match or the crowd at a festival. There is something lovely about being part of a bigger thing. And there are other advantages too. It is often said that there is safety in numbers. But not always. Sadly, we are all well aware of a growing number of people who are dying of coronavirus. The total currently stands at somewhere around 15,000 and is almost certainly heading to something over 20,000. None of us want to be in that number. That is why we are all socially distancing ourselves and taking refuge as much as we can in our homes so that we can be kept safe. Revelation chapter 6 told us about another large crowd. A very large crowd. Just see who's in it. It's coming up on your screen. Chapter 6 verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Well, that sounds like everyone to me. The great and the good, kings, princes and generals, rich and poor, slave and free, everyone. And look at what they are saying. It's in verses 16 and 17. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? We are currently sheltering in our homes to avoid coronavirus. But this is an image of there being nowhere to shelter when the day of God's wrath comes. That is the day of his judgment upon the earth. That's why having run to the mountains to hide, but realising that they can't hide, they cry out for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. And so comes the question at the very end of the chapter. Who can stand? It's asking, who can survive God's day of justice? All humanity is guilty before God. We're all sinful. Who then can stand? Well, wonderfully, chapter 7 shows us that there will be a huge crowd a vast, innumerable crowd who will stand on that day. And it's worth seeing that now because chapters 8 and following are going to show us the terrible and fearful judgments that are going to be unleashed on the earth. In fact, at the start of chapter 7, everything is in place for the unleashing of God's wrath at human sin. Just have a look at verses 1 and 2 with me. They're on your screen. After this... I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to, to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. You see, everything is ready. Angels are ready to bring harm on the earth, both the land and the sea. But here, the winds are being held back. They are the kind of winds that destroy everything in their path, often seen on the south coast of America and on uh, the Caribbean islands. But according to Revelation 7, it's going to be global. It's going to affect the four corners of the earth. You probably remember, but in Revelation, numbers are always symbolic. We've already seen, haven't we, that the number seven 
means complete or full, as in seven days of the week. And so the seven churches in chapters uh, two and three represent the entire church, the complete full church. And the number 12 and its multiples represents God's people based on the 12 tribes of Israel and the ministry of the 12 apostles. Well, the number four represents the whole world, as in the four points of the compass, north, south, east and west. And so everything is teed up in verses one and two for God's wrath and judgment to be unleashed on the whole earth. And who can stand? Who will survive? How can they? The answer is in the rest of chapter 7. At the moment, uh, given the situation we're in, we are used to having triple messages directed at us in order to keep us safe from coronavirus. You might have seen the posters around. Uh, there's this one from the NHS. If you want to sneeze, catch it, bin it, kill it. And then there is that general health advice. Coronavirus, what you need to do. Wash your hands, use a tissue for coughs, avoid touching your face. And every day at the government coronavirus briefing, the podiums that the various ministers and health officers stand behind also have a triple message on the front. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. It's a very stark and serious message. If you want to survive, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Well, there's something quite similar, but even more serious in Revelation chapter 7. If you want to stand, that is, if you want to survive on the day of God's wrath, then the message is this. Be sealed, be counted, be washed. If you want to stand, be sealed, be counted, be washed. Those things may sound a bit strange, so let me explain. Verses 2 and 3 say this, Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. God's ultimate judgment upon the earth is being delayed until the full number of his people have been saved and those people will have a seal put on them. Now, that seal is not a literal mark on people's foreheads. Remember that Revelation uses lots of picture language. The point is that God knows exactly who belongs to him. That's what seals do. They identify who the thing with the seal on belongs to. It's a mark of ownership. Having God's seal is not something that is going to happen in the future. Revelation is mainly God's perspective on the present, described in picture language. There's a bit of future stuff towards the end of the book, but mainly it is God's perspective on the present. His people are being sealed now, ahead of the day of judgment. Judgment is ready, but it is being held back while God's people are sealed. Coronavirus is not the ultimate judgment. The ultimate judgment is still to come, and it will be far worse. Now, although there is not a literal mark on people's foreheads, God's people are being sealed in a real way even now, so that they will be kept safe when God's judgment is unleashed. It might remind us of the blood of the Lamb that was put on the door frames. Uh, by God's people in Egypt. That blood was like a seal that marked them out. And so when God came in judgment on Egypt, his people, everyone who sheltered under the blood of the Lamb, were kept safe. 
and were untouched. Well, it's the same now. All who are to be safe and untouched by God's ultimate judgment must be sealed. And how do you get sealed? In the New Testament, God's people, that is those who believe and trust in Jesus, are sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is by believing and trusting in Jesus, the Lamb who is now on the throne, our Passover Lamb, who shed his blood so that we may be saved. It's by believing in him and in him alone that we shall be sealed and safe. Listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. It's coming up on your screen. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. This sealing takes place through the mission of the church as people respond to the good news of Jesus in repentance and faith. That's why even in these days of lockdown, we must not be ashamed to testify about the risen Lord Jesus who destroyed death and brings life to all who will believe in him. That's how people receive God's seal, the seal of his spirit, only by believing in Jesus. But you might wonder from verses 4 to 8 if there are a limited number of people who can be sealed. It's in those verses, verses 4 to 8, that we're told about the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel who are sealed. Well, as I've said before, the numbers in Revelation are symbolic. They are not to be taken literally. The point here is that God will save everyone he wants, the full number of his people, before his judgment comes to destroy the earth and the wicked. In Revelation, a thousand, the number one thousand, is a symbol of vastness. So we've got Israel represented by 12 tribes, multiple, multiplied by the ministries of the 12 apostles, multiplied by vastness, by a thousand. 12 times 12 times a thousand. So like all the other numbers in Revelation, the number 144,000 is symbolic. And you can see very clearly that it's symbolic in verse 9. Have a look at that verse with me. John writes, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. This is the very same crowd as the 144,000, but described in a different way to make a different point. The point before was that it is God's people, 12 times 12 times 1,000. The point here is that it's an international crowd that God has saved, and in reality, it is so vast that it cannot be counted, not by human beings anyway. There are people from every nation, tribe, people and language, all standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. All the racial and ethnic barriers have been broken down. Being one of God's people is not to do with race or ethnicity. It is to do with faith in Jesus. And everyone who believes in him is depicted as wearing white robes, which is a symbol of purity and righteousness. This is the true people of God. This is the true Israel. We may seem small in number today, but the Church of Christ, of which we are a part, is massive. Although the number in this crowd may not be able to be counted by us, God knows how many he has sealed. And it is only those who are counted by God in this number who will be able to stand on the day of his wrath. Be sealed. Be counted. 
But then one of the elders wants to know, verse 13, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And the answer is in verse 14. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The government has made a big deal recently about the need for us to wash our hands to help keep us safe from the virus. You need to wash if you're going to be safe. Well, it's the same here in Revelation 7. Though you have to say that verse 14 appears to be the worst piece of laundry advice ever. Sounds bonkers, doesn't it? Washing a robe in blood. Blood stains. It's, it's sometimes impossible to get out. How could washing anything in blood make it white? But the blood of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the only thing that will wash the deep and filthy stains of our sin away. The blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only thing that will wash the deep and filthy stains of our sin away. You see, the ones in white robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, well, they are those who have put their faith in Jesus. They are the people who trust that his death and blood shed on the cross is what atones for our sin and makes it possible for us to be right with God. It is the only thing that makes us right with God. It's the only thing that will enable us to stand on the day of his wrath. Not going to church, not helping our neighbours, not volunteering to help the coronavirus effort, good though all of those things are, not anything except the blood of Jesus will enable us to stand on the last day. If you are not a Christian, and you want to stand on that great day described at the end of chapter 6. Well then you must be sealed and counted and washed. Those are just three different ways of describing becoming a Christian. Putting your faith in Jesus. Believing in him as your personal Lord and Saviour. When you do that, you will be sealed with God's Holy Spirit. You will be counted amongst God's people and you will be washed clean. Your sins will be washed away. It is only those who kneel before Jesus now that will be able to stand on the fearful day of God's wrath. It is only those who kneel before Jesus now that will be able to stand on the fearful day of his wrath. Please do get in touch if you want help to become a Christian, or if you want to ask some questions, we'd love to help you. Finally, and far more briefly, if you have been sealed, counted and washed, then worship, be assured and be thrilled. If you have been sealed, counted and washed, worship, be assured and be thrilled. It's right, isn't it, that we all thank the NHS workers for all that they are doing. We, we thank them, but we don't worship them. But what God has done for us is worthy of nothing less than worship. Do you see what the great multitude is doing in verse, te in verse 10? They are worshipping their God and Saviour. God who sits on the throne and who masterminded the salvation of his people and the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, who carried out the plan. The multitude are shouting out at the top of their voices, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And that gets the angels and the elders and the creatures around the throne going. So they start worshipping again too. One day we will join in with all God's people and all the company of heaven in worship. But we are called to worship today. We are called to live lives of worship today. If you have been sealed with the Spirit and accounted amongst God's people, 
because you have been washed by the blood of Jesus, then worship is not an option. In fact, worship is a sign of our being sealed and washed. We delight to worship Jesus. But also, if we have been sealed, counted and washed, we should be assured. Be assured that we are safe. In verse 14, the saved are those who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, the great tribulation is not a particular event. Some people have thought it is, but it's not a particular event. It is simply a reference to life on this fallen and sinful earth. Some of the following chapters of Revelation will show Satan doing his worst against God's people. Well, he's doing that today, isn't he? For most people, this life will be a life of trials, a life with varying amounts of suffering, but suffering nonetheless. For some, coronavirus will come their way. For Christians, life will often involve some form of persecution, even death. But nothing will keep those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb from being in this glorious gathering. Ultimately, we are safe. We are in safe hands. So we should be assured that we are ultimately safe, even though we will go through many trials and tribulations. But also be assured that you are ultimately safe with regard to the coming judgment, that day of wrath that chapter 6 and lots of the Bible tells us is coming. In the coming weeks, we are going to see in Revelation chapter 8 and following some frightening images of the judgment of God coming on the earth. And so I want to say to us, as we look in the pages of Scripture at images of riders on terrifying looking horses and trumpets being sounded and bowls of wrath being poured out, I want to say to all of us who believe in and trust in Jesus, we are safe. As we look at these chapters to come, don't forget Revelation chapter 7. We are sealed. We are counted. We are washed, and so we shall stand. Remember, the Israelites who eventually came out of Egypt were not taken out of Egypt before the coming of God's judgment. No, they were kept safe through the judgment as they sheltered under the blood of the Lamb. Well, we too can be assured as we shelter under the blood of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we will be kept safe on that ultimate day of wrath. Be worshipping, be assured we are safe, and then be thrilled. Be thrilled with what we are told in verses 15 to 17. These verses are just a little foretaste of the fuller picture we shall get in chapters 21 and 22. But there's enough here to make our hearts sing. The end of verses 15 and, uh, and verse 16 tell us that God will protect us and provide for us. His tent will cover us. We shall be completely safe and secure. No harm shall be done to us. The heat of the trials of life will be gone. The remembrance of sin will be no more. And we shall have everything we need there will be no more hunger, no more thirsting. And verse 17, our Lord Jesus, the Lamb who shed his blood to save us, is also our shepherd who will guide us. He will guide us to springs of living water, presumably the spring of living water that he once described to a Samaritan woman that wells up to eternal life. And there will be no more tears. Imagine it. Nothing to spoil our joy and happiness. Nothing ever again to weep over. In this life, our joy will always give way eventually to tears. The loss of a loved one, the loss of health, a broken relationship, the effects of sin. 
but one day all that will be gone. All possibility of that will be gone. There will be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more coronavirus, no more death. As we face ill health, natural disasters and all the other trials and tribulations of life, may this vision encourage us to endure, to keep going with Jesus as we see the life that awaits all who love and trust Jesus. If we have been sealed, counted and washed, may we worship our great God and Saviour while we wait for all that is to come. May we be assured that we are safe in the tribulations of life and supremely in the judgment of God. And may we be thrilled, thrilled to bits with all that is to come. Will you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for this vision of an innumerable crowd from every tribe and tongue and language around your throne, worshipping you and enjoying you, enjoying your protection and your provision. Thank you. Thank you so much that a day is coming when you shall wipe away every tear from our eyes. We look forward to that day. Thank you that salvation belongs to you. And so we pray that you will help each one of us and many more at this time to trust you and to trust in your Son, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>